Disclaimer. This book may contain content that is considered historically inaccurate or culturally insensitive by modern standards. My hope is that by exploring old literature, we will better understand why people of the past thought the way that they did and understand the influences that shaped their culture. This video is not intended for young audiences. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I'm excited to read you from Paul Bunyan by Jane Stevens. Shanty Boy In Paul Bunyan's time, camp entertainment was of, by, and for the woodsmen. In Paul Bunyan's camp, there were hypnotic storytellers, singers who could make you laugh and cry in the same moment, and steppers who could do a breakdown, fit a shot, or the frame of a bunkhouse. Old Paul knew the importance of social pleasures for his loggers, and he made natural provision for them. A good bunkhouse bard was marked by the great loggers' a special favor. Many a man who toiled poorly was saved from the lowly life of a farmhand by his ability to dance, whistle, and sing. Consequently, Paul Bunyan's bunkhouse nights are as famous in history as his great feasts and labors. Every night but Sunday, when the twelve hours of toil in the woods were ended and supper was over, the tired loggers would be cheered and consoled by the bunkhouse bards. There was one for each shanty, and each one had his own particular virtues. There was Big and Tall, for example, who made his mates in bunkhouse 999 hilarious as he told quaint tales about logging in that very fine country, which she's three weeks below Quebec. Angus McIlderoy of Bunkhouse 1313 was made to sing The Island Boys a dozen times a night by his song-loving comrades. And Tinty Hulun of Bunkhouse 6000 jigged with such violence and speed that a modern jazz band would have gone crazy trying to make music fast enough for him. The rattle of his jigging feet sounded like the buzz of a big bee. His bunkhouse cronies boasted that he could imitate any known sound with his feet except a tired logger snore. And this, anyone admitted, defied imitation or description. Tinty Hoolan was a swamper and a poor one. His feet, however, saved him from life among the scissor bills on Paul Bunyan's farm. Now these were three of the greatest of Paul Bunyan's bards, and no one has ever found words to describe them or to give them fitting praise. And if words fail with them, how can they reveal the brightest star? Of all Paul Bunyan's performers, indeed, Shanty Boy of Bunkhouse One was more than a star. He was a constellation, for he was an entertainer with a thousand talents. What old logger does not feel his own soul dance as he hears in the Bunyan histories? The soft, vibrant patter of Shanty Boy's right foot, the thunder stamp of his left foot, the sharp rattle of his heel cracking, and a great breakdown. He not only danced with his feet, but with his hands and eyes. He had a dancing grin, too, which would shine now on the right side of his face. Now on the left, Shanty Boy put his whole soul into, dan into his dancing, and so he did with, with his stories. When he told a Swede story, he was a Swede, and when he told a dirty story, he was dirty. He was never content with mere pretending. He made entertainment of everything, and he did it naturally. A log would roll over his leg when he was at work. That night, he would hobble down the bunkhouse aisle like an ailing old man, talking in the mournfulest way. Oh, lotty boys, I lo, I ain't long for this life. That new medicine I'm using don't appear to be doing my rheumatism no good. No good at all. I expect I'll be having to change the nut to another kind again. Then he'd hobble back again, drawing his sore leg up like a string-halted horse and groaning, Mmm, mmm, I love, I feel worse than anyone that ever lived in this year world and lived. If somebody asked him what time it was, he would take out his old watch, hold it at arm's length, throw back his head and squint at the watch like he was looking at it through glasses. He claimed that Grandpa carried that watch for nine out forty years, and it won't tell us the time unless I look at it just like he did. Sometimes he would sit down by the stove and eat an apple or a raw turnip. Then he would pull his hat down over his eyes, and while he chewed away, looking as solemn as a politician, he would make that hat... He would make the hat bob up and down to keep time with his jaws. No one else could have done this without seeming foolish, but Shanty Boy always kept a kind of dignity when he was performing that made men respect him even when they were laughing at him. 
but it was his songs and stories which truly endeared him to the loggers. His renditions of John Ross, Jack Hegarty, The Island Boys, and Bung Your Eye were so affecting and inspiring that the loggers, what with laughing, crying, stamping, clapping, and cheering, often made so much sympathetic noise that the song itself could not be heard. Shanty Boy only sang two nights a week and then for no longer than four hours at a time. The other nights he danced and told true but thrilling stories of life in the woods. The bards from other bunkhouses would come to hear him and then give give imitations of his performances. His supremacy was unquestioned, yet he remained unspoiled. For he was more than a mere entertainer. The mightiest of Paul Bunyan's loggers lived in bunkhouse one, and his log logger shanty boy was the peer of any of them. Sorry, and as a logger, Shanty Boy was the peer of any of them. He could not a tree or work in white water with the best of the fallers and rivermen. He held his own with even Mark Boku and the rough bunkhouse frolics. He was Paul Bunyan's favorite faller, and the great logger often carried him to the woods on his shoulder. He had an equal an equal rank with Hot Biscuit Slim, the chief cook, Shagline Bale, the freighter, and big old blacksmith. He was a true hero, and a time came when he reached the greatest height of glory ever attained by a plain logger. Here is how it came about. The year of the two winters had been disastrous for Paul Bunyan. Winter had come again in the summertime that year, and the cold increased in the succeeding months. At Christmas time, there was 50 feet of ice on Lake Michigan, and by the last of February, the lake was frozen to the bottom. Paul Bunyan was then engaged in logging off the pen peninsula country, and of course, his operations were halted. He cut the ice into blocks and hauled them out on the lake shore with Babe, his big blue ox, who could bowl anything that had two ends on it. This was done so that the ice would melt more quickly when normal summer weather returned. Then he moved his outfit to the old home camp in the Smiling River country, where severe weather was never experienced. Paul Bunyan had done no logging around his old home camp for seven years. The remaining timber was so far from the river and on such steep hills that profitable logging seemed impossible. However, it was the best to be had, for elsewhere it would be weeks, even months, before the snowdrifts would melt away from the, te from the treetops. Paul Bunyan tackled the tough logging problems before him with characteristic courage. He was sure that his inventiveness and resourcefulness would, as always, triumph over every obstacle. His most stubborn and difficult problem was that of getting the loggers to the woods in the morning in time to do any work and getting them home at night in time to do any sleep. One plan after another was tried and dropped. Failures all. Paul Bunyan began with an attempt to work one day shift, but the loggers could not get to the woods before lunchtime. Lunch finished. They had to start at once for the camp. Two shifts were then put on, but little work could be done at night, except when the moon was full. Paul Bunyan then sent the great Johnny Inkslinger, his timekeeper and man of science, to investigate the Aurora Borealis as a means of artificial lighting. Johnny reported that it was pretty but unreliable, and he doubted if even the blue ox could move it down from the north in less than six months. A learned inkslinger then sat down and figured desperately for a week, trying to devise a method of working three 12-hour shifts a day. With such a routine, one shift could be doing a day's work, work, while a second shift was coming to work, and a third was going to camp. Johnny Inkslinger was, beyond a doubt, the greatest man with figures that ever lived, but here the, his mathematics failed him. Paul Bunyan then thought of making a campsite in the timber, and he dug for water in the high hills. He succeeded in reaching a mighty vein, but it was so deep that it took a week to draw a bucket of water out of the well. It was out of the question as a water supply for the camp. Now Paul Bunyan had to fall back on a last plan, a far-fetched one that seemed well-nigh hopeless. This was to build a great sled, something on the order on the order of a lunch sled, and have Babe the Blue Ox haul the loggers to and from work each day. It was a desperate plan, and no one but Paul Bunyan would have had the courage to attempt it. It must be remembered that the blue ox measured 42 axe handles and a plug of chewing tobacco between the horns. An ordinary man at his front had to use a telescope to see what he was doing with his hind legs. He was so long. He had so much energy and such delight in labor that no one could hold him when he started for the woods in the mornings. 
He was so fast that Paul Bunyan's foreman, the big Swede, who was as tall as the trees, could not begin to keep up with him. Only Paul Bunyan could travel so fast. Whenever Babe moved the camp, he traveled at a careful pace. But even then, some of the loggers were made seasick, and all of them became so irritable when a move was being made that they fought constantly among themselves. If the comparatively slow camp-moving pace of the blue ox thus upset them, his timber-growing gallop would be apt to ruin them completely. Paul Bunyan remembered how the big Swede, hanging to Babe's halter rope, was hurled through the air, only striking the ground once in every quarter of a mile or so, when the ox rushed to his delightful labor each morning. A lunch sled full of loggers would be dragged by Babe in much the same fashion. It would be in the in the air most of the time, and when it did strike the ground, loggers would be scattered like autumn leaves. The loggers who would hang on until the woods were reached would have the living daylight shaken out of them. A common lunch sled would not do. One must be invented that would hold the road. So Paul Bunyan devised the serpentine bobsled. It was a long, low-built contraption. The runners were made in short sections, connected by double joints. When it was completed and lay in the road that led from the camp, it looked like a squat fence, for it snugly fitted the contours of the hills and vales over which it extended. There's a rig that'll hold the road, said Paul Bunyan with pride. Now I'll invent something equally good to hold Babe to a slow pace. Several mechanical devices were tried without passing the first test. The sled lay idle. The loggers got sore feet, and they traveled so slowly that they began to take twelve hours to reach the woods. There was one shift on the road, going, and one coming all of the time. Not a tree was being felled. There's no way out of it but to try the grizzlies, Paul Bunyan told his timekeeper. Among the other livestock on Paul Bunyan's farm, which was down the river from the old home camp, was a herd of grizzly bears. The great logger often amused himself by playing with them, and he had taught them many tricks. Not the least of their stunts was for each bear to hang from a tree with three paws and try to claw Paul Bunyan's mackinaw with the other paws he dodged by. I'll station them at the trees, which are left standing along the road, said Paul Bunyan, and when Babe roars by, they'll hook him. They may only frighten him into a faster run, but I think surely they'll slow him down. The next morning the loggers, for the most part, joyfully crawled upon the serpentine bobsled. The timid and cranky among the loggers were pessimistic, of course, and declared noisily that this would be the end of them. But Chanty Boy and the other bards laughed at their fears, and at last every logger in camp was on the sled. Paul Bunyan ordered the big Swede to hitch up the blue ox and start in half an hour, and he departed for the woods with his herd of grizzlies. He stationed one of them at every tree close to the road. When he reached the timber, he straddled a hogback and sat down to wait for the outcome of his daring attempt. In a short time, he heard a faint thunder down in the valley. Then he saw enormous balloons of dust twisting up in cyclonic bursts from the foothills. Next, he heard the crushing sound of hoofbeats that got louder and louder. Through clouds of dust, he saw Babe's tail brush lifted like a triumphal banner and the glitter of his horns. The big Swede, hanging to Babe's halter rope, soared and dived. The bears had failed. Indeed, they had failed terribly, for when Babe came to a halt in the timber, Paul Bunyan saw bear paws hanging from both sides of him. Only one bear had saved his paw, and he was holding a tree in a frenzied clutch. Babe had carried away bear, tree and all. Paul Bunyan rushed back over the road, and he came to each unfortunate grizzly he mercifully... And as he came to each unfortunate grizzly, he mercifully dispatched him. He carried them all into camp. Bear meat for Sunday dinner, he said to Hot Biscuit Slim as he threw the bears into the kitchen yard. Paul Bunyan then had Johnny Inkslinger bring his medicine case, and the two hurried to the woods. But only a slight number of loggers had been made truly ill by the terrific speed with which Babe had hauled them over the hills. The double-jointed sled runners had slipped over rocks, logs, and gullies as easily as a snake glides over a string. Not once had the sled bounded from the road. Not a logger had suffered a jolt. Some of them were dazed and breathless. Others were choked with the dust. But most of them were no more than badly scared by their terrific journey. I tell you, it had been no use trying to hold, hold Babe down, said the big Swede with rare eloquence. The sled worked perfectly at any rate, said Paul Bunyan. We can depend on it. But those good bullies of mine are going to need a lot of encouragement to stand that ride every morning. 
He was quite right. His loggers thought nothing of the perils of falling limbs, which are called widow-makers today in the woods, breaking up log jams, jumping rolling logs, dodging butts of trees which bucked back from the stumps when they fell. All this was in the day's work, but even the serpentine bobsled could not banish the terrors of riding behind the blue ox each morning. I'd rather try riding a peavy handle down the west branch. I'll tell you, babe, went so fast, I actually see in the wind, and I never seen anything more sickening in my life. What if babe had a throw to shoe now? I bet it'd detour through us like a cannonball. Paul Bunyan frowned as he hearkened to their complaints. His loggers seldom thought of anything but their labor when they were in the woods. If they were complaining now, what would, what would happen when the bunkhouse quinks got into action after supper? There would be much gloomy grumbling and perhaps rebellious talk. When the loggers went to bed, they would brood over the, the cyclonic morning ride instead of getting fortifying sleep. Then they would soon balk against riding behind the blue ox. To avoid such an event, he must call on his bards to cajole, humor, and inspire the men until he could devise new methods to solve his logging problems. With this idea in mind, he took Shanty Boy aside, placed him on his knee, and explained the situation. I sure will do my best, said Shanty Boy, but look ye here, Mr. Bunyan, I low I'll have to lie to him right smart. How oh, so, my lad? Well, I've always done the best I knowed how when I set out to be amusing, so if I'm going to make my stories in a thinker, I'll just have to stir a few lies into him. Son, nobody loves a liar. That's just it, Mr. Bunyan. I got a powerful good reputation for truth, and I can lie quite a spell afore I'm catched. But if I do, I get catched Mark Buku, and them roars will chaw me up. You've learned all the loggers to hate lying just like you, you do yourself. I'll probably get spilled if I was catched. Besides, I just naturally hate to lie. Yet, no lying, no logging seems to be the fact of, of the matter. Paul Bunyan pondered doubtfully for some time. Moral issues baffled him always, but at last he spoke with decision. Logging must go on. You may lie if necessary during the period of emer emergency. Them's orders, Mr. Bunyan, but what if the gang gets hostile and starts to chaw me up? Again, Paul Bunyan hesitated. It was against his policy to interfere in the loggers' personal affairs. Then, firmly, a boy with your talent should not have to lie, shanty boy, in order to entertain his mates. But you know best, of course. If you are discovered, tell the men that all complaints must be lodged with me before they act upon them. Be cautious and discreet, and honor and glory shall be yours. I will, sir. Thank you, sir, Mr. Bunyan. Shanty boy went bravely to work, carrying out the great logger's commands. For some time, it was not necessary to tell more than two or three lies a week in order to take the logger's the loggers' thoughts off their sickening morning rides. They were not great lies that he told, either, but only plausible exaggerations. Most of his stories were still true ones, and he told them better than ever. He inspired the visiting bards as never before. Each night, he sent his mates smilingly to sleep, entirely forgetful of the ordeal that awaited them in the morning. But this was not natural, and of course... It couldn't last. The loggers lost weight every day, and they began to complain of hurts in their innards. The bunkhouse cranes got their dismal course started, and Shanty Boy had to tell real big lies to hush it. He lied wonderfully indeed. Once he was well started. He got so funny that the loggers had to strap themselves into their bunks while they listened to him. They went to sleep laughing as a rule, and the night long they would chuckle in their dreams. Shanty Boy grew bolder with success. He told, with a bare face, stories about snakes that had many joints, and how they would separate into pieces and crawl a dozen ways at once. He called them joint snakes. He told stories about a snake that would put its tail in its mouth and roll downhill. He called it a hoop snake. When the loggers got a little tired of snakes, he told whoppers about possums, then about coons, and so on. At last he got around to fish, and he told so many good fish stories that the loggers would not let him switch to another subject. He ran out of ideas, but the loggers would not let him get away from fish. 
One night, as he was trying desperately to invent a tolerable lie about fish, he remembered a story of a whale that he had heard his grandfather tell, insisting that it was the gospel truth. It was the old story about Jonah and the whale, and the loggers had never heard it. They became indignant when Shanty Boy repeated it for the plain truth, and some of them began to shout at him. For the first time in his life, he got stage fright. He felt that he was telling the gospel truth, but his memory of his previous lies overwhelmed him. He tried vainly to, co to continue his narrative about Jonah's life in the whale's belly, but his tongue failed. He dropped his head, and he fixed a shamed gaze on his feet. First he heard nothing but the pounding of his heart. Then an angry mutter ran along the bunks. It grew into a fierce growl. Then Shanty Boy heard the tramp of feet, and he looked up to see Mark Buku and the bunkhouse cranks advancing upon him. She's lie! yelled Mark Buku. Sakura, but she's tell a big one! He shook a huge brown fist under Shanty Boy's nose. Now you're fix yourself. Stand up while I knock you down. The loggers left their bunks and made a pressing crowd around their discomfited discomfited bard and his challenger. I was count you stand up. One, two, three. When Shanty Boy remembered Paul Bunyan's all compl Then Shanty Boy remembered Paul Bunyan's All complaints must be lodged with me, and courage returned to him. You bunkhouse crank sure give me a misery, he said contemptuously. You just go and tell my story to old Paul and see what he says about it. The loggers stared at him with amazement. Pai go, exclaimed Mar Boku, Mark Buku. The fool want me tell these to old Paul? She's want me tell these that crazy thing. That's what I said, growled Shanty Boy. Run along before I get into one of my tantrums. Knowing Paul Bunyan's furious opinion of liars, the loggers were smitten with horror. Of course, the story might not be a lie, but most likely it was. And what old Paul would do to, t would do to him for telling it? Mark Boku was triumphant. Soon, Bunkhouse One would have another king. It should know a rule of iron instead of laughter. Come with me, he commanded his friends. The other loggers, except Shanty Boy, followed them to Paul Bunyan. As Paul Bunyan listened to Mark Boku, he was struck with a powerful regret for having inspired his greatest bard to leave the path of a truthful narration. Des desperate circumstances had seemed to justify the step, but what a risk he had taken just to save a few weeks' logging. The faith his loggers had in him lay in, his, in, the, lay in the balance. Now it seemed that he must lose this faith or sacrifice a hero. He had never dreamed that Shanty Boy would recklessly tell such an incredible story. Surely he had not told it unthinkingly. No doubt he could explain it. Paul Bunyan sent for him. It was with a heavy heart that the great bard walked through the lines of silent, accusing loggers. It looked like the end of everything for him, but he kept his courage, and, as he walked slowly on, his nimble mind was leaping from idea to idea, seeking a solid defense. What, but what proof could he offer for such a story? His grandfather knew it was true, but the old man was far away in the southern mountains. He alone must prove somehow that he had not lied. Paul Bunyan's boots loomed before him. He must think hard, hard. This story must be explained, said Paul Bunyan in a stern voice, and at the same time flashing him a look of the utmost sympathy. I know the story is beyond explaining, Mr. Bunyan, but I never lied when I told it, said Shanty Boy bravely. Prove it, roared Mark Buku and his followers. Shanty Boy drew himself up pridefully, and he fixed upon the multitude a, a gaze of lofty scorn. I never lied, he declared. I never lied, for when I, I lie, my neck, it, it swells. And now, look! He jerked open the collar of his shirt and exposed his muscular throat. There was not a sign of swelling about it. The loggers lifted a mighty cheer, and Mark Buku, baffled, beaten, completely outwitted, could only swear. She's done swell, by go, she's done swell! Paul Bunyan could not restrain a windy sigh of relief. The trees bent before the blast, and dust clouds rolled through the ranks of loggers. Now was the moment to complete the victory. Get to your bunkhouses, Paul Bunyan roared. Shanty Boy was carried on the shoulders of yelling admirers to bunkhouse one. Mark Baku and the bunkhouse cranks did not venture to follow them until the lights had gone out. Then, humbled and quiet, they sneaked into their bunks. As a result of his troubles, Paul Bunyan came near to abandoning logging operations in the Smiling River country. But one night, he got an idea, an idea so simple and sound that he was astonished and not thinking on it before.
of not thinking of it before. He put it into practice at once, and when the loggers awoke the next morning, they saw wooded hills at the very door of the camp. Paul Bunyan had simply thrown a cable around each hill, and the blue ox, who could bowl anything that had a top on it, had snaked everyone into camp. So the logging men went on easily until the new summer had melted the ice and snow, and Lake Michigan was filled with water once more, and had new fish in it. Shanty Boy's triumph was complete. Not only did he have great honors from Paul Bunyan, but his mates now revered him as well as admired him. His adventures from truth had hauled off revolt from the bunkhouses. He had convinced the loggers of the truth of the grand old story of Jonah and the whale, and he had made all and he had made them all fear swelled necks as the result of lying. This last effect persists to this day, for everywhere loggers are still known as the most truthful of men. And that is the end of Shanty Boy uh, by James Stevens. Thank you for listening to, the, listening to this story from Paul Bunyan with me, and I hope you return soon for the next one. Have a great day!